welcome to this session of Cause Seminary. Glad you clicked on this video. Glad you're here and uh, believing that you're going to grow and uh, especially in your knowledge of God, who is God and who are we in God. So with this session, we're talking about the nature of sin and salvation in Christ. How's all that work? What does the Bible have to say about that? Now, of course, when it comes to sin, there's no doubt we have this great propensity to, to point, you know, to point at others. And, you know, it's pretty easy, after all, to find somebody that's a worse sinner than us, or I guess how you want to look at it, maybe a better sinner than us, depending on how you want to say it. You know, it's, it, it's, it's the liberals, or it's the fundamentalists, or it's the terrorists, or, or somebody that's very clearly evil, you know, capital E-V-I-L, right? There was an old 60 Minutes episode where the host, his name's Mike Wallace, uh, did a segment on a Nazi by the name of Adolf Eichmann, and he was actually one of the chief architects of the Holocaust, and on the outset of this program, here's the question that was asked, how is it possible for a man to act as Eichmann acted? Was he a monster? Was he a madman? Or check this out. Or was he perhaps something even more terrifying? Was he normal? Now, obviously, in some sense, of course not. Um, we're, we're not all Nazis. But the point that was being made was clear. As a result of the fall, sin is in each of us. Not just susceptibility to sin, but sin itself. So Genesis 1 culminates with saying God saw everything he made, and indeed it was very good, Genesis 1.31. The description very good uh, includes the entire universe, of, of course, also humankind, male and female, every single one of us. And in addition, as we discussed in our session about humankind, we also bear the image of God, the divine image, and as God's regents, God's special creation, we have dominion over the earth. You know, we discussed why the universe is here and why we're here, to know God, as the theologian said, and to enjoy God's presence, to be in relationship with God forever. And then the next few chapters of Genesis move from essentially the ideal of the past to the reality of the present. So here's a question. If the world is very good, then why is sin and evil and ruin running rampant? What's gone wrong with the world, and, and especially, of course, with humankind? That's what we're asking with this session. According to the Bible, according to God's inspired revelation, all the world's problems can be summed up in one three-letter three word, sin, S-I-N, sin. Genesis describes the, the paradise that Adam and Eve lived in prior to the fall. Eden, Eden becomes biblically a symbol you know, in Scripture for, for cosmic redemption, as, as paradise lost reverts to paradise regained. Eden, scholars have said, perhaps means the light or, or maybe the garden of the Lord. Uh, Augustine, talking about the city of God, as in the new heavens and the new earth, the city of God, said it will be like Eden, only bigger and better. Or uh, another theologian said, it'll make the lush, delightful parks of Walt Disney World feel like slums. So that's where we're going as believers, eventually, this new Eden, this new heaven and earth. Uh, it was the Lord, of course, that planted the garden in Eden and, and placed man there to till it, to keep it. The park was perfect. The, the Bible tells us there was no thorns, there was no thistles. The man's work was creative, and it was fulfilling. And by the way, just as an aside, heaven doesn't mean no work. It means perfectly fulfilling work. It's different. And, and maybe that's for another session. But so God gave man, the woman, as his partner, and they were together in completely guilt-free, perfect union of relationship with love and meaning and beauty. And we all know the Bible says they were naked and unashamed. Then in the middle was the tree of life. And, and it conferred or, or it, it granted, it bestowed eternal life. And neither Adam or Eve took from this tree. God actually made sure of this after the fall. God only stipulated that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said, you, 
cannot eat from. You shall not eat from. For in the day you eat of it, you shall die. Genesis 2, 17. It was only one command, right? A test, not a temptation. And there's a big difference. Please hear me. God tests us, but God does not tempt us. God has good purposes. But then, of course, enter the serpent and and. The serpent has these evil designs of almost unimaginable, you know, proportions and scope and scale. The Bible says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made, Genesis 3.1. So a few notes here. We have to assume that there was a fall from the heavenlies prior to the fall of Adam and Eve for the serpent. The serpent is clearly portrayed as pursuing evil intentions. So, so here's what that means. Sin already existed prior to the fall of humankind. It's important. The serpent here symbolizes sin, temptation. We learn from Revelation directly that this ancient serpent is none other than the great dragon, the devil, Satan, also called the deceiver of the whole world, Revelation 12, 9. The the talking snake is the personification of the evil one, of the devil. So what can we say about this? The fall account in Genesis tells us of the entrance of sin into the human race, not of the origin of sin itself, which took place in the spiritual realm when Satan and some of the angels rebelled and fell from heaven. So we know what the serpent did, twisted what God had said. You know, the serpent came along and said, did God really say? And the deception is basically, basically to convince Eve, to convince the woman to believe that God is holding out on her. And, 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 and holding something back by prohibiting her from partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was really the personal autonomy to determine what was morally right and wrong. That's what was on the line here. That's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the fruit that she took and ate represented. And, and oh my goodness, are we not seeing this today where everyone has their truth. This is my truth. And, and, I, and, and everyone is scrutinizing God instead of realizing actually God is going to scrutinize them. People are attempting to judge God and God's word instead of realizing God's word is going to judge them. And not realizing God is the only judge. Everything is, is reversed as to what it should be. We're, we're going to decide our own version of right and wrong and then attempt maybe to make God fit into that. And it's rebellion. It's idolatry. And really, it's the essence of sin. Uh, people these days uh, are, are talking about deconstruction. People might call it critical theory. It goes by many names, but all it really is is just sin, just like it's always gotten into the spiritual bloodstream of people questioning God and wanting independence from God rather than dependence on God. It's to think our eyes are open and that we are wise or that we somehow are equal to God when actually we're spiritually blind, morally bankrupt, and apart from revelation of Jesus, without hope. New age spiritualities, all the like, they're always pushing personal divinity. And it's a lie that actually goes straight back to the Garden of Eden. You will be like God. So Eve took and ate, and the consequences of, of what happened with humanity We've been feeling it ever since. The devil lied and said, you will not die. This was just flat out straight lie. The the devil said, you will not lie. That's why Jesus said the devil was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And then, of course, Adam also ate of it, and immediately the effects kicked in. Their eyes were open, but what they saw was not what they wanted to see. It, it, It was like seeing the horrors of hell instead of the beauty of heaven. And then fear and shame come, and now it consumes them. They recognized um, shame in themselves and in one another. They're now in this lost condition. They try and hide themselves from each other. They try and hide from the Lord. Spiritual death, watch me, was immediate. Physical death would come later. Uh, It it was actually a threefold death uh, God had warned them about. It was spiritual, that happened right away. It was physical, that happened eventually. And then sometime after that, there would be, of course, the final uh, death of judgment that, you know, that, that comes later. The tragedy is horrible. Innocence is lost. It, it, you feel it in the text. It's like guilt hovers. 
Fellowship with God is broken off. There are barriers of shame, and all of a sudden, there's almost like this spiritual schizophrenia that kicks in and invades their souls, and they try and rationalize their sin away, and, and, and just like we've done many times, they cast blame. The man blames the woman, and then the woman blames the serpent, and, and God's judgment descends on all of them. There's a curse on the serpent. The woman uh, uh, will have much pain in childbirth, will be subject to her husband. The man will work himself to death, tilling the soil to which he will return when he does die. This is the curse. But in the middle of all that, there's grace. There's hope. There's God's promise. When the Lord cursed the serpent, he announced a permanent enmity between humankind and the serpent. And, And then here comes the very first, really the announcement of the gospel. All the way back in Genesis 3, Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So even in the midst of judgment and and on that fateful day in the garden, the Lord God remembered mercy and grace. God clothed the the couple with animal skins to cover their shame. Genesis 3.21, this is a type of sacrifice and, and it's, a, it's a type, it's a picture of, of later being clothed in Christ, being covered by the sacrifice of Christ. And then, in order to prevent them from eating of the tree of, of uh, life and living forever in their fallen state, God dr- drives them out of the garden, places cherubim, a flaming sword to guard the way, and nothing would ever be the same again. So, as the narrative continues, pretty soon we've got Cain murdering Abel, and, and the development of human culture depicted in Genesis 17 illustrates an important fact about, about civilization and, and just human endeavors in general. Check this out. Even the most sophisticated cultures can be full of great evil. We know this if we even take a glimpse at history. Nazi Germany, like we mentioned a minute ago, would be a great example of this. Social cultural, economic advance does not diminish the corruption that's in the human heart. We can't legislate away sin. We can't regulate it away. We can't make enough advancement to get rid of sin. So we see um, these these sort of mysterious verses from here about intermarriage uh, of the sons of God and the daughters of men. And uh, there's a lot of mystery around these. It can be interpreted in different ways. But the, what we do see is there's this rampant spread of evil, maybe now with more prevalent demonic powers in the earth, and the world is just filled with violence. It's like sin just breaks out, and the world's full of it. And then we have the flood. God's judgment rendered. But even in that, of course, there is a way. Noah found favor in God's sight and is preserved, you know, and, and, and then in turn preserves the human race. Then this whole opening prologue of creation of humankind and the fall, it culminates in the story of Babel. Um, one theologian, Jacques Ellel, said that the primary symbol of sinful humanity's defiance and rebelling against God was the city of Babel. It began with Cain, Cain going away and building a city. And, and then they said, let us build for ourselves a city with a tower and its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. This same theologian, Elul, went on to say, to make a name for oneself has nothing to do with the modern expression referring to reputation. So it wasn't like, hey, let's make a name. Let's make sure people know who we are. It means becoming independent, and that is what their attempt at building meant. The people wanted to be definitively separated from God. It represented a desire to exclude God from his creation, and the sign and symbol of this enterprise is the city they wanted to build together. And of course, if you know the story, God steps in and says, nope, no way, not on my watch, and confuses their languages and scatters them over the face of the earth. So God planted a garden paradise, and then humanity comes along and defiantly attempts to build a city. So here's what happens. God takes this proud symbol of their rebellion and turns it into the emblem of our salvation, the city of God. It begins as far back as Abraham where it says, he was looking forward to a city with firm foundations whose architect and builder is God. So we have this kingdom, 
the city of God that arrives with power on the day of Pentecost, whose city, uh, or, or, or who, this city whose architect and builder is God, this kingdom. And then on Pentecost, it's people from every nation, language, and ethnicity. They're gathered, and there's this dramatic reversal of what happened at Babel. Check this out. At Babel, human languages were confused and the nations were scattered. At Pentecost, the language barrier was supernaturally overcome as a sign that the nations would be gathered again together in Christ. And it's prefiguring the great day when the redeemed from every nation, tribe, people, language will come together in God. And in addition, check this out. With Babel, the earth proudly attempted to ascend to heaven. But with Pentecost, heaven humbly descended to the earth. So from here, beyond Genesis, uh, with the discussion of sin, it's important to look uh, especially at Paul's theology and even more particularly at Romans. uh, And and we can start to gain some keys to understanding the nature of sin. Uh, By the way, this is really a shorter session compared to the time we could spend on a subject like this. But we're going to do our best to give some framework. Romans is a gospel book and therefore is a good news book. But the reality of the good news is that it's only good news because it's contrasted with the bad news. Sin is the bad news. The Savior is the good news. So chapters 5 through 8 of Romans describe the Christian life as one of having peace with God, sanctification, freedom from condemnation of the law, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Paul explains how how formerly helpless, ungodly sinners who used to be enemies of God now have peace with God because of reconciliation. And and Paul is clear that sin, this is important, is universal in scope. It's not just what happens when a Christian knows better but doesn't do better. Everyone is in sin and everyone is a sinner. Whether or not they spent their whole life in church or whether they've ever opened a Bible, everyone, the Bible says, is a sinner. But then Paul makes an even more profound point. What Christ accomplished is universal in scope as well. It's like Calvin said of Romans, for certainly Christ is much more powerful to save than Adam was to ruin. So Paul's message to the Romans at a glance is something like this. What both Adam and Christ did has affected all of us. What Christ did, however, is infinitely greater and more powerful than what Adam did. Here's what a theologian, Gordon Fee, said, which, by the way, if you ever see anything by Gordon Fee, check it out. Gordon Fee is awesome. Fee said this, in saying that all die in Adam, Paul means that this common lot of our humanity is the result of our being in Adam. That is, being born of his race and thereby involved in the sin and death that proceeded from him. Now, one question that that many Bible scholars, thinkers have asked is this. Did we all sin in Adam and therefore die? Or do we inherit a sin nature from Adam and die because of our own sins? Does does that make sense, the distinction? So some of what we're discussing in this session, it, it, it might feel like splitting hairs, but it actually has profound implications for our entire framework, our, our, our whole theology. So do we inherit Adam's guilt? And guilt is an important phrase. One way to see it is that what Adam did, just, just by relation, just implicates all of us. Augustine, who of course was a you know, theological giant, saw sin and guilt as being imparted to us through heredit- like hereditary, like in a, basically like your kid might get your blonde hair or you know, your brown eyes or your musical talent or whatever. That's how Augustine saw sin as, as actually being given to us like through our, like, our, like the code of, of humanity. So let's look quick at Romans five eighteen. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification for all. For just as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So again, Paul is saying sin is universal, but there is no universalism of either guilt or salvation. Does that make sense? So we're we're all in sin, but we're not necessarily guilty and we're not necessarily saved. That's where we participate in either our guilt or our salvation. So 
Just like Christ's righteousness is imputed to us conditionally on the basis of our faith, guilt should be seen as as it's imputed to us conditionally on the basis of our own volitional, like when we choose to sin. We've all made the choice, of course, in our life to sin. So, So one of the implications of this, again, why it's important to look at this, is like the implication with kids, with children. Like when, when a child tragically dies early before the age of accountability, they're not prevented from heaven because of some inherited guilt. They're, they're, they're not guilty. So to, so to use a theological term, traducianism, traducianism. This teaches that our parents hand on to us our spiritual natures as well as our physical natures. I don't know if maybe if you have kids and, and you've seen this, but I, I feel like I've seen this in our own kids, that we, that we somehow pass on to them some of our, our spiritual nature, something beyond uh, the physical or maybe even emotional. Uh, even genetic studies uh, seem to actually suggest this, like there's, there's personality orientations and, and susceptibilities could be good or bad, like maybe like a proclivity to an, ad- an addiction or something. It can be traced um, to, you know, our hereditary, um, the nature of all of that. So, so Paul calls the fallen nature that we inherit from Adam the flesh, the flesh, and describes that everybody, as in all humans, are under the same power of sin and death. Those outside the law, as in those that are not Jews, die as a consequence of their sin. Those who have the law and willfully break the law die as a punishment for their sin. But everybody dies because of sin. So let's make one distinction. Paul gives us a theology of original sin, but like I said, not original guilt. As as in individuals are held responsible for deliberate acts of defiance against God and his law. And at some point for all of us, you know, we lose our innocence. We consciously embrace our sin nature. And it, again, if you have kids, you know this happens early on. And, and our bondage to sin, though, is made painfully obvious at that point. Only the cross of Jesus applied in our lives personally by the power of the Holy Spirit can liberate us, break off that downward pull that sin would have on us. So in introducing his gospel, Paul says that the good news reveals a righteousness from God that comes through faith. Romans 1.17 Then he immediately points out that God's wrath has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Those are important, ungodliness and unrighteousness. Those two words really provide a summary of what the Bible means by sin. We had somebody ask us one time in in our ministry, they said they they were brand new to walking with Jesus, and, and they just said, well, what is sin? I wanna make sure that I'm not sinning. What is sin? And, and we were kind of grasping for an answer. It's, it's actually a really big question. What is sin? Now, we can break these down a little bit, but, but the Bible, basically, in summation, sin is ungodliness and unrighteousness. Here's how we get that. Because they're pointing us towards the essence of sin. Human life, for all of us, consists of two fundamental relationships. One is vertical, our relationship with God, and then one is horizontal, our relationship with with others, with human beings. Ungodliness, of course, that has to do with our relationship with God. Unrighteousness, that has to do with our relationship with others. You see this in the Ten Commandments. The first four concern our relationship with God. Then the last six deal with our relationships with others, with, with people. Jesus, of course, came along and said, we are to love the Lord God with our whole being and to love our neighbor as ourself. All the law and the prophets hang, Jesus said, on these commands. So if sin is the transgression of God's law, then then we're getting near the heart of what sin actually is when we perceive it as as the failure of relationship to the love command of Jesus saying, love God, love people. So let's break it down a little bit. What's ungodliness? So, you know, a godly person humbly is, is reverent before God, worshipful towards God, and an ungodly person refuses to acknowledge and glorify God. I'm 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 gonna refuse, I'm gonna turn. An ungodly person does not live by faith, but in unbelief, which, by the way, unbelief is sin. In Romans 1.18, Paul depicts this ungodliness that characterizes us as ignorance and idolatry. It's our willful ignorance that, we, that Paul says we suppress the truth. 
but, but God's general revelation, like if, if you step outside and look at the mountains or you just, you have that, that deep down knowing in your knower, that general revelation says it leaves us all without excuse. So ungodliness is to suppress that truth, that, that, that image of God, that, that ability to relate with God that we all have. Humankind simply refuses to acknowledge God. Um, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. You know, in today's world, everyone is, is cynical and unbelieving. It's almost seen as a virtue. Have you noticed that? That, that somebody that's, that's sarcastic and cynical and, well, I'm not gonna believe that. It, it's, it's, it's like a virtue. It's like, well, it's a badge of honor that you wouldn't believe. And this is a big part, by the way, of deconstructionism. The anthem of deconstruction is it's good to ask questions. Well, let me say, maybe to a point, it's, it's not good to ask questions about God when God has already given you answers. That's called rebellion. That's, that's ungodliness, as the Bible would define it. And, and it's a spirit. De- deconstruction is a spirit. There's, there's a difference between having a question for God, humbly coming before God, God, give me understanding. I want to know you more. There's, di- there's a difference between having a question for God and then, and then having a questioning of God. That's, again, that's called ungodliness. That's rebellion. And, and by the way, the reality of every quote-unquote new idea is nothing new. It's just the same old human arrogance and the ignorance of God. And, and then Romans 1.23 forms this sort of transition to the next aspect of ungodliness, which is idolatry. They exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles or whatever. Martin Luther said that humankind either has God or has an idol. That's a big statement about who we are. We were made to worship God. It's in our very nature. We are creatures of worship. So if we refuse to worship God, we will inevitably end up worshiping somebody or something else. Uh, another theologian, Millard Erickson, said that sin is the displacement of God, putting something else in God's place. Billy Graham one time preached a sermon called Let God Be God. Let God Be God, which is to say, the, again, the essence of sin is our failure to let God be God. Idolatry in any form is really, it's, it's part of the essence of sin. Erickson also highlights unbelief as the major factor in our failure to love, worship, and obey God, it's basically a summary of Paul's words in Romans 1. So then, Paul continues looking at sin by examining, now next, we looked at ungodliness, now unrighteousness, sins of of, of the human flesh, sins of the human spirit. So we have ungodliness, turning from God, serving little g gods. This is the vertical part. Now now this is the horizontal part. This is how we relate to others. So this is sin like, like lust and pride and envy and laziness and gluttony and, and, and on and on the, the list goes. Uh, an example of this, a hot button example would be the sin of homosexuality. Um, you know, it's a, it's a huge subject, but f- honestly, for those that acknowledge the authority of scripture, there is absolutely no question about it. Absolutely none. It's sin, not a sexual preference, not a lifestyle choice, not an orientation, it's sin. Now, of course, like every other sin, we, we've got this proclivity in us to, to point out what other people might be struggling with and not what we're struggling with. And the Bible does say that for every temptation, there is a way of escape. Now, just because it's not your temptation doesn't mean it's a worse temptation, but for everybody, for all of us, whether you need to find a way of, of temptation in terms of the, you know, you're tempted to commit adultery or to look at pornography or to be in some homosexual, you know, homosexual relationship, whatever it is, there is a way of escape. And, and again, according to scripture, homosexuality is loathsome, it's abhorrent. The Bible says it's nauseating to God. Paul says those who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. I, I figured we're talking about sin, we might as well just get into all the topics, right? Now, now, let's be quick to say this, though. Churchy people can sometimes highlight some sins of unrighteousness and seem to forget about others. Churchy people, here's a good example, are really good at gossip. But, hey, some of this stuff, it's in the same list as homosexuality. So we always, here's our disposition, 
We always hate the sin and love the sinner. It, we've, we've said it so much, it's almost cheesy, but I, I pray if you're watching this, you're here, that that would get in your spirit. We hate the sin, but we love the sinner. We, we walk in compassion and, and we, we pray and we, we point people to Jesus. And when we don't have answers, we know that Jesus is the answer. Amen. So let's talk about now the results of sin. The results of sin. In a word, the result of sin is death. Death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, so sin is death, and then the contrast, Christ gives us free gift, eternal life. Sin is always deceitful. It promises freedom, but delivers bondage. Promises life, but gives death, right? Sin works against our, our, our sense of meaning and purpose, our, our fulfillment in life. Eternal life, however, the free gift of God, um, it, it speaks of a quality of life as well as unending life. Not death, but life forever in the presence of God. It, it's life lived in, in relationship with the one that made us to know him, to, to be with him forever. And in Christ, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. His death, that's what 1 Corinthians 15, 26 tells us. So we look toward the day in which God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more, the Bible says. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. So death is a physical reality. We, of course, see this every time we go to a funeral or we hear about somebody that we would know that's died. But death is also a spiritual reality. Adam and Eve died, died spiritually uh, in the spiritual sense when, when they became alienated from God. That's what it is to, to be dead spiritually, to be away from God. So spiritual death, it, it has to do with blindness. Our minds become darkened. Our hearts are hardened. It also means we're, we're in this sort of servitude. We're enslaved to sin. Uh, it, it's not even that, well, okay, well, now I'm going to sin when I feel like sinning. We're actually enslaved to sin. That's what the Bible says. And we're completely unable to save ourselves. And it doesn't mean, though, that the image of God that we bear as God's special creation, it's not completely annihilated in us. So you'll see sometimes that even unsaved people are still capable of revealing some, some bit of God's image, God's maybe goodness. Um, they, they would contribute in some way or, or you know, make some beautiful piece of artwork. That's, that's still the image of God that's showing through. Then the final result of, of, of sin that brings death is eternal death. It's what the Bible calls in Revelation 26, the second death, the second death. So there's waiting for humankind, a day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. That's what it says. And Jesus is the central focus here. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life for God's wrath remains on him. What's the implication? When we believe on Jesus, God's wrath is taken off of us. It's all about Jesus. So let's, let's shift now and ask, how does Jesus save us? Sin is the bad news. Jesus is the good news. Our God is a saving God. And all through the Old Testament, we see God delivering and saving and rescuing his people Israel all through the Bible, we see um, types and specific predictions of the one who was to come and what he was going to do, namely Jesus. One important word from the Septuagint, which again is the Greek translation of the New Testament, is sozo, to save, the Greek for save. It, it, it refers to saving from physical death, uh, from, from physical illness, also saving from demonic possession, uh, or from the death that has already occurred, right? But... By far, the, the greatest number of uses refers to spiritual salvation, sozo. So let's ask a few questions. What makes spiritual salvation necessary? What makes it possible? The Bible makes it abundantly clear that all people need a Savior and cannot save themselves. Modern, um, sort of rationalistic or, or enlightenment-type thinking, um, which, which basically is going to end up denying the doctrine of original sin is going to assert that humankind is innately good. It's important that we understand this so we can navigate some of the waters that we're in right now. 
So this type of enlightenment thinking, this modern thinking, um, is the reason that now people might get offended when you say, hey, you need a savior. That something in them rises up and says, what do I need saved from? Why? Because they have a baseline viewpoint that would say, I'm not innately bad or sinful, I'm innately good. So, so this would say, we just need more education. When everything's going wrong, or we, we just need better legislation. We need to get the right politicians in, or, or, or we need more advancement or whatever. But it's just another form of the same old sins, ungodliness and unrighteousness, rebellion against acknowledging God. Think about for a minute the results of human, humanism, like enlightenment humanism, which is basically to say, we've got this on our own. We, we can achieve it on our own. It, it's basically sort of another version of people attempting Babel once again. Let's build something high and let's, let's be God for ourselves. What happened after the enlightenment, after everybody said, hey, we don't need God anymore, we can do this on our own? Massive world wars, genocides, horrible atrocities, and the list goes on and on and on. The endeavor for humanity to pick itself up is a failed endeavor. It's important to understand this. The more humans depend on themselves, the worse it gets. Now, the Bible tells us that he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Proverbs 17, 15 says, acquitting the guilty and condemning the innocent, the Lord detests them both. What is this saying? These are attributes of God. This is who God is. God's saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna acquit the guilty. I'm not gonna condemn the innocent. Both sides of this coin are, are important in the heart of God. Um, and, and if we try and weaken these parts of who God is, these attributes of God, then we end up weakening all the attributes of God, such as the love and the grace and the mercy of God. So, so what I'm trying to say is the cross all it implies for us only has real meaning in the view of a righteous God, a holy God, who requires judgment. Because, look, if he's really not so, so angry with sin that it requires judgment, then the cross becomes this sort of pointless, actually loveless act. But, of course, if the opposite is true, that there must be judgment, and, of course, we know this, the cross is the most loving act that's ever occurred. So, so we need to seriously consider God's righteous judgment and anger towards sin and the penalty that must be paid. But at the same time, the Bible also shows us God's mercy and love and grace. Like 1 John 3, 16, God is agape, God is love. Therefore, he gave his one and only son, John 3, 16, to save humankind. The Bible shows us that God's goodness moved him to save the lost, and it also teaches that nothing external to himself compelled him to do it. God said, I'm, within himself said, I'm going to do this. So redemption finds its source in his free and perfect and amazing love and will and plan toward us. So, okay, let's talk for just a minute as uh, we move toward the end of this session. Let's talk about theories of the atonement. And when we say atonement, that's basically like payment for wrongdoing, uh, the atonement. And um, these are some of the theories that the, the church has held at different points in history. And some of these have a, a layer of, of scriptural truth, uh, maybe more than others. And then we'll, we'll get to um, the best theory of the atonement. So one is the moral influence theory. This view would say, that God did not, did not demand payment for sin, but in his love, he just sort of graciously forgave. And so in the incarnation and the cross, we, we're really just seeing a demonstration of God's overwhelming love. So, so this vision moves us with this gratitude and love and, and therefore brings us to repentance and faith and all, all of what we need. But it actually sees no atoning purpose or effect in the cross. So of course it's true that when we see an example of great mercy like the cross or, or you know, like bravery, somebody does something brave, that can move us to be brave. But this really breaks down and just fails because it, 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 it just doesn't take into account God's holiness and righteousness, as well as just all these biblical statements of the effect of Christ's death and Christ's resurrection for us, all right? So moving on from there, that theory is pretty weak. We have the ransom theory. So this emphasizes Christ's victory over Satan. So because of our sin, we're under Satan's domination, but because 
God loves us. He offered his son um, to the devil as a ransom price to set us free. So the way that this theory goes is like this. The evil one, the, the devil was more than glad to make the exchange. Okay, if, if I'm gonna get Christ, if this is the ransom price, okay, fine. It, it, that, that's a great you know, trade or whatever. And, and then with the resurrection, the devil loses both the ransom and his original prisoners, which, i.e., would have been us. And, and the problem with this theory, the, the early church fathers had no, no problem with sort of seeing God as this sort of deceiver that was like, okay, I tricked the devil. You know, I, I said, okay, here's the ransom price, but you didn't know it. Jesus was gonna get up on the third day. And they were kind of like, well, God just had wisdom and just knew, and that was okay. But we don't really need to see God as like cunningly deceiving Satan um, it's kind of a biblically weak view in representing God's character. God is truthful. God reveals. God doesn't need to be tricking anybody, right? So moving on from there, the satisfaction theory. Uh, theologian, early theologian, <clears throat> lived around um, the year 1033, Anselm, gave a viewpoint um, that was very popular, still is actually uh, Catholic church, some of the Protestant church, um, about the atonement. He said that in their sinning, People insult the honor of the sovereign, infinite, eternal God. So in insult to a sovereign head, kind of looking at like, um, like a, a vassal and servants, insult to a sovereign head cannot go unpunished and demand satisfaction. But, and, and we're getting a little technical here, but stick with me. How could that be achieved by us if the sovereign head is also the infinite God? At the same time, God's love pleads for the sinner. So how does the apparent conflict in God find resolution? We commit the sin and therefore must render the satisfaction. We gotta pay the price. But because only God could do so and we alone must do so, only a God man could satisfy the insult to God's honor and pay the infinite price for our forgiveness. Now that's a mouthful, but it does make some sense biblically, right? Um, one thing people have said that Anselm failed to take into account is that God could be merciful without jeopardizing his superior place. God could just say, I'm, I'm just gonna be merciful. And it's also been said that this theory sort of implies this conflict within God, that it's like, I, I must be honored, but also I'm gonna, and so it doesn't quite line up, all right? So moving on from there, the governmental theory, developed by Hugo Grotius, the 1500s. Hugo was a jurist, um, picture, you know, kind of a statement, a, a theologian, sort of like a lawyer type, and so was naturally drawn to viewing God as this lawgiver who both enacts and sustains law in the universe, and the law states that the soul that sins has to die, right? Shall die. Strict justice requires the eternal death of sinners. So for him, the primary focus was not in saving sinners, but in upholding the law. That was the emphasis of this viewpoint. So Christ for him, for Hugo and, and people of this viewpoint, Christ is like an example of the depth of sin and the, and the lengths to which God would go to uphold the moral uh, order of the universe. So you know, there's a little bit of truth in this maybe that, that the penalty inflicted on Christ is, is also, you know, it's instrumental securing the interests of divine government. Everything's uphold, but it doesn't really express the heart of scripture. So now moving on to the, the strong um, theological viewpoint. And, and part of the reason I give these other viewpoints is, is you'll hear some of this maybe creeping in here and there, and you wanna know how to navigate these. But the penal substitution theory, um, this is gonna reflect the thoughts of the reformers, of e most evangelicals today, and, and for whatever it's worth uh, of myself. This states that Christ bore in our place the full penalty of sin that was due. His death was vicarious, meaning it was totally for others, for me, for you. So he suffered not just for our benefit, but he also suffered in our place. So, of course, the New Testament never uses the exact phrase penal substitution, but it's a name for you know, what represents a multitude of verses. It, it, takes, it takes both God's holiness and righteousness seriously, and, you know, and, and so they're expressed and they're, they're poured out on Christ, but it also takes into account what the Bible says about our total depravity, our inability to save ourselves, and God's great mercy toward us, right? So a few aspects of Christ's atoning work. Sacrifice, all throughout the Bible, sacrifice stands at the heart of redemption. This goes back to God uh, making animal skins for Adam and Eve. It, it's the imagery of the lamb that we see all through the Old Testament. 
uh, God, God saw the, the lamb that was slain, the, the blood was sprinkled across the doorpost, you know, with the Passover, and then God's judgment would pass over them. Uh, John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Isaiah said that Jesus would be led like a lamb to the slaughter. Uh, Paul called Christ our Passover lamb. So there's sacrifice involved with this. Jesus was, gave us great sacrifice. So, so one question that might come up that's, that's just sort of interesting to think about because we're so in it deep with this subject of sin is if Jesus bore the penalty of our guilt by taking the wrath of God on himself, covering our sin, did, did he suffer the exact same consequences and punishment in degree that all the people he died for would have cumulatively have suffered, like all of humanity, was all of that put on Christ? Does that question make sense? Like, like all, all our punishment, all at once, was all of that put on Christ? Um, he was one, we are many, you know, with questions like this, I don't know if you thought I was about to give you an answer, I don't have an answer for that. I just thought it was an interesting question to ask. Um, my humble opinion would be that yes, he did. That, that's some of the magnitude of the sacrifice of Christ. It, it, of course, it was the physical death, but so much more than that, it was that spiritual suffering of, of all of that wrath, that separation from God, right? And then uh, another aspect, important aspect, reconciliation. Broken relationships of every kind put back together. The New Testament is abundantly clear. The work of the cross is a reconciling work. Jesus removed all the barriers. Jesus tore the veil. Um, Paul uses uh, the term as someone would almost use like in accounting practices. Almost like to say the reconciling work of Christ restores us to God's favor almost because it's like the books have been balanced. All, the accounts have been settled. The wrath of God, you know, is put on Christ. So one more question we're gonna ask and then we're going to close out this session about the nature of sin and, and how we're saved in Christ. Let's ask this, what is the order of salvation, i.e. how are we saved? Um, what does the Bible say about that? Um, how we experience the process of going from a sinful state to a saved state, from sinner to saint, what does that look like? Paul mentioned some important phrases that we'll give a little bit of definition to. Foreknowledge, this is important. Predestination, uh, calling, justification, glorification, all these phrases. We don't have time to cover it all, but this has a lot to do with how a person sees the doctrine of depravity. Meaning, does, does depravity or our lostness, does it imply a total inability um, of, you, that would necessitate a regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, enabling us to believe and respond? Like, does the Holy Spirit have to do something before we can do anything at all? This is an important question. Or do we have enough of the image of God left in us to where we can, of our own volition, our own will, respond to the free gift of God's salvation. So we're talking about predestination. We're talking about foreknowledge. What does the Bible have to say? A couple things to hit. The Bible very clearly teaches divine choosing, that God chooses. God chose Abraham. God chose Moses. God chose David. The list goes on. We have a God that chooses. The New Testament, God's choosing refers to a remnant of Israel choosing believers, the elect, the Bible calls us as believers. And it's, it's individual, it's collective, it's in multiple verses, it's all over the place. God chooses. So there's always an initiative with God. Jesus outright told the disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you. Or Peter just showed up, or, or sorry, Jesus just showed up with Peter on the beach. Hey, I'm hey, come and follow me. J Jesus said, I chose you. So here's where... Uh, Calvinism sees these types of passages affirming this doctrine that God essentially makes this arbit arbitrary choice that does not take into account in any way human response or participation when it comes to salvation. But the problem is that even in these verses, like Romans 9, there is also clear evidence of participation. Jesus didn't pick Peter up and say, I'm going to drag you with me. Jesus said, hey, come follow me. And then Peter, it says, set down his nets and participated and followed Jesus. There was a response of faith. 
So what about these verses where, you know, where, where God would harden someone's heart? Like, that's a confusing verse for a lot of people, where God hardens the Pharaoh's heart. Um, so we have to ask, well, did Pharaoh have then a decision? Or was Pharaoh, at this point, the Pharaoh just sort of like this, like this puppet in this sovereign play that God was putting on? Well, it seems like the decision to rebel against God was essentially, at some point, set in. It's almost, it's almost like the Pharaoh, um, here's an analogy, kept pouring the cement of rebellion until God just finally let it set. Does that make sense? So, so Paul says Israel had experienced a hardening of heart, but it seems to be saying almost that their disobedience, their disbelief, their stubbornness, that they kept choosing now is sort of locked in, in a sense. But you know, we, we don't have to look at these verses and say, well, there it is, we have to believe in this unconditional election, meaning God chooses people, and those people that God chooses have nothing to do with it. God just chose them, and God didn't choose other people. But Jesus, who is always, by the way, at the center of all good theology, is full of love and shows no particularism. Jesus, the Bible says, came for the whole world. Here's a key verse. Write this down if you're taking notes in this session to fill in some understanding. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God chose you, there's the choosing, to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and, here's the participation, belief in the truth. I get excited about this. Through God's choosing and through your believing. Through predestination and participation. Our God loves the whole world. So, so can an idea like, like God seemingly randomly choosing some and ignoring the rest to hell stand up against a God who is the light of the world? Nope, never in a million years. Think about this. Christ's death fulfills what God has spoken would happen through the prophets. God knew it was going to happen. God foreknew that that was going to take place. But at the same time, the Bible's really clear. God did not cause anybody to crucify Jesus. The, the, the Bible says the Jews acted ignorantly and crucified Jesus. It was something they did, they chose to do. Now, I'm working towards a point. So God does not have to predestine something in order to foreknow that it's going to happen. Does that make sense? So, so God can foreknow who will be saved, but not predestine some to be saved and others to not be saved. That this is kind of one of those points where it's kind of mind blow emoji again. We just sort of run out of analogy. We run out of ways to explain it. But we can't quite fit God into all our little theological boxes at this point. And Jesus came along and Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Let me ask, what's the difference? Everyone is called, many are called. The chosen are those that choose Jesus in response to being called by Jesus. When Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross, he embraced everyone because God so loved, the Bible says, the world. Not a pre-elected percentage of the world, but God so loved the world. God is love, and the very nature of love implies that it can be resisted or rejected. If love can't be resisted, then it's not love, it's just slavery. It's a forced relationship. So love, just by nature, is vulnerable. If, 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 we're, if we're wondering about, well, what about this Calvinism and God's pre think all the way back to the garden. It was real love because right in the middle there was a choice. Love, love can be discarded. Love can be abandoned. There's a choice with love. And none of this has to disservice God's greatness or sovereignty or power or omniscience. To believe we, that we can refuse or accept the free gift and that God is also completely sovereign. There has to be response, and the only response is to fall down to say yes, of course, to the free gift. Here's in closing what Stanley Horton said. In concluding the parable of the king's wedding banquet, Matthew 22, Jesus said, the many are called in a context that certainly has eternal destiny in view. It shows that, at least from the standpoint of human response, the circle of the called and of the elect cannot be taken as necessarily coinciding the very word call implies a response. 
And if we respond to it, we become God's elect. Can we resist the call? Yeah. Calvinism te teaches that we can't because God's working always achieves its end. So for Calvinism, regeneration follows calling but precedes repentance and faith. I know that kind of sounds like a mathematical equation, but it's important to understand this. But it can, and, and I would say should be said, that the very nature of grace, which is a free gift, can be accepted or rejected. Amen? So, hey, I, I want to say thank you so much for joining us for this session of Cause Seminary. I hope you can also check out some of the other subjects and topics on um, this page, and uh, we'll see you next time.